The strongest thing about Soreline by far is its premises. And at the core of that premises is the Nerve Gear, a seemingly magical device that connects the mind of its user directly to a computer. But how does it work, and can you make one in real life? For the sake of my look into the Nerve Gear, I'll be using the Yen Press English translation of the first book for my primary source, and the anime is the secondary one. So according to the book, the Nerve Gear has a diamond semiconductor CPU, uses a multi-layer electric field, uses microwaves, intercepts nerve signals, converts them to digital information, by some form of science magic, I assume. It can see your face and it knows your voice. The easiest thing to address is the diamond semiconductor CPU, and they are possible. If things continue in the direction they're heading now, they'll probably see use as diamond manufacturing lowers the cost, and if the test results from an Intel lab or on the internet are true, they can run at 81 gigahertz. For reference sake, the i7-7700K released in January, a high-end consumer CPU, runs at 4.2 gigahertz. That's a 180% increase. But there is a catch. Diamonds are still incredibly expensive, and the main draw to using diamonds is its ability to withstand incredibly high temperatures with no negative effects, which brings a few problems. From the few shots we get of the Nerve Gear, it looks like its only external connections are Ethernet for internet and to an electrical socket for power. So in our case, that CPU is on top of your head. Most silicon CPUs have severe problems at around 100 degrees Celsius. Diamond chips are made to get many times hotter. And judging by the helmet's design, there's no cooling. Modern air and water cooling methods are simply too bulky to fit. So there's a very real problem for the person wearing a plastic helmet with a processor that will continue to rise in temperature till it simply burns out or some sort of protection method is triggered switching the nerve gear off, which in the context of Sword Online leads to the user's horrific death by being baked from the inside out. Assuming you don't die, there's still some problems with the helmet. Depending on the type of plastic used, the melting point may be anywhere from 70 degrees centigrade to 500 degrees. But even if the plastic doesn't melt, the wearer will still most likely suffer from third degree burns, which can be as cause as low as 120 degrees, with exposure for more than five minutes. I don't know about anyone else, but when I sit down and play a game, I tend to spend considerably more time than that. And in the context of the story, the characters have been wearing these helmets for two years. Okay, now that we have the CP out of the way, Let's see about the microwaves it uses to render its user's brains to be something closer to a baked potato than a working organ, or on a semi-lighter note, to see the wearer's face. And if anyone's wondering, it does have a real-life counterpart in the form of millimeter wave scanners used for airport security across the United States. These scanners make an image of the person in them, and laser scanning can be used to make 3D models, so combining the two can be feasibly done. As for what does besides get a scan of the user's face, I have no idea. I couldn't find any information about microwaves passing through a skull, but one information I did find said that when microwaves pass through people, most of their energy is lost in muscle, not skin. So theoretically, you may be able to pass through the skull, but it would not pass up the other side. Instead, because of how microwaves reflect off water, it would most likely do nothing, but it could cause burns and do nerve damage. So take that as you will. Now, onto something that doesn't kill you. The nerve gear's multi-layer electric field which is a bit strange, not because it doesn't make any sense. A electric field is the fact an object with electrical charge has another object. It's strange because an electric field is not really used in affecting brains. Magnetic fields are. I'll be touching more on them a bit later, but for now, just know I don't have any real problem with this. It just feels a bit strange enough to point out. Some last notes with the show's nerve here before I move into the real life things. I don't know how it may know its user's voice. The book did say there was a setup process when you first get a nerve gear, and that's how it knew the user's body shape, so maybe it gets the user's voice there. And the main point of contention for me is that it somehow stops nerve signals from traveling down the user's spinal cord. Simply put, this is nothing short of science magic, and can't be done without permanently damaging the user's spinal cord or changing the brain's chemistry. But hey, Kaiba is a quantum physicist apparently, so who's to say there's not some type of quantum bullshit at work? So. The real reason you come to watch this video, how to do it in real life. Well, in short, you have two options. You can either control the game using EEG or receive information from the game using transcranial magnetic stimulation. Footage on screen shows a man playing the popular MMO World of Warcraft using a special EEG setup called the Graza BCI Game Controller. But it's far from being able to do the type of action shown on the show. It's a clear example that we're moving in that direction. And you can do more than just play games with it. For instance, controlling drones to fly at their rings, and controlling robot arms, which may be able to let disabled people have some form of self-reliance again. If you have any interest in the Graza BCI game controller, the site is in the description, along with every other source I used. 
but enough of real life back to theoretical means of controlling video games, or as transcranial magnetic stimulation does, control you. Back in 2013, the first recorded direct brain-to-brain -brain communication happened at University of Washington. On the screen, a game is being played by two researchers in different rooms with no means of communicating besides the caps on their heads. The man with the black cap is looking at a screen that shows a rock heading towards the city. And to stop it, he uses whatever science magic makes the EEG work to send a message through his EEG cap that causes the magnet placed on the man with a profile's head to pulse, making his finger click a button. Well, a very simple form of stimulus, so simple some people say that this experiment can't even consider to form brain-to-brain -brain communication, but it does show potential for more advanced stimulation like images and the other senses later down the line. While we're nowhere near the tech shown in the show, we do have some things vaguely close to it, like using an HTC Vive on an omnidirectional treadmill, but for the true VR experience, we'll just have to wait and see. It'll most likely be nothing like what we see in the show. It'll probably be similar to things seen in The Matrix, as there's so many less problems with invasive BCIs, assuming it does ever happen. But who knows? Well, I have no more to say about the Nerve Gear. The atmosphere is not even worth commenting on. Seriously, there's not even enough room for a CPU, let alone the magnets needed to project an image directly inside the user's mind. But there are things left in Sword Art Online to cover, like the system that runs the whole thing, the logistics of a self-aware AI, and the augmented reality device called the Augma in the new movie. But since that isn't out in the West yet, I'll just have to wait some time to see when it comes out of theaters. Until then, I'll see you next time.